Jeff Kurtz is the assistant propagation manager at Spring Meadow Nursery. Uh, he's been with Spring Meadow for 11 years and started out as an intern. His current duties at Spring Meadow include coordinating the harvest of cuttings in the stock field, as well as half of the cuttings from their plants in production. Uh, he's in charge of coordinating the sticking of cuttings both manually and with robotic stickers, maintenance of those robotic stickers, uh, and Jeff is responsible for close to two acres of greenhouse space uh, and the booms that are in that area. Um, Jeff, if there's anything you want to share before we uh, roll into your awesome video? Uh, um, yeah, I can just kind of give a quick overview of what we're going to talk about. Um, just kind of covering everything in the prop propagation aspect. So cutting, sticking, uh, our soil mix. Uh, we'll talk about um, the greenhouse environment and the booms. Uh, we'll also talk about like how, how we store the cuttings in our cooler and we'll, we'll talk about equipment we're gonna get in the future. Awesome. All right, let's roll right into it. Hi everyone, I'm Jeff Kurtz, Assistant Propagation Manager with Spring Meadow Nursery. So today we're gonna to talk about our whole propagation process. This year we're gonna do about um, 20 million cuttings. So I'm gonna take you through the process from taking the cuttings out into the field to how we store them, the soil we use, then we'll talk about sticking and the hormones we use for that. We'll talk about manual sticking versus robotic sticking. And then we'll end talking about the greenhouse environment where we root the plants out in our traveling irrigators. We're out in our production fields taking cuttings off some hydrangea limelights. We take cuttings out here in the field mid to late May, and then we'll go up through August uh, for deciduous cuttings. The first two weeks of August, and then, then after that, everything starts to get a little too hard and it doesn't, it doesn't root very well. We go take cuttings inside for about a month and then we'll, or maybe two months, and then we come back and start doing evergreen cuttings out here. With cuttings out here, it's, it's pretty similar to cuttings inside, just the, the plants are a lot bigger and we don't have to worry about keeping them trimmed and, and nice for, for sales. Um, so so we, can get a, we can get a lot more cuttings out here. Today, these limelights we're gonna cut, they're gonna be stuck with our ISO machine, so they won't be in bundles. Um, but if we, if we were cutting something that, that wasn't for the ISO machine, like a, say a magnolia or a sambucus, we, we would put them in a bundle of 50. We bypass that because the machines work better when the cuttings are loose. It's just an ex extra step. You know, somebody at the machines would have to take the, the rubber bands off. And e even so, they would stick to the, they would stick, kind of stick to the bundles together and it'd take a lot of shaking. So we kind of do them loose. Most plants, there's, there's a couple different types of cuttings you can take. You can either do, do what's called a terminal or we, we call it a tip cutting where you're taking the very, the very end of the plant or you can do a subterminal. We usually here we just call it a two leaf cutting where you're taking the lower part of the plant. We try to do one or the other or, or if we are gonna do both, we try to keep them separate because in, in the greenhouse, when, once they've rooted, they leaf out at different rates. So, so if you have a mix, you'll get a real in, inconsistent group of plants and they kind of need different trim requirements in the early stages. If we're going to do tips and two leaves, we'll keep them separate when we stick. That way, that way the trimming is, is equal. For weighing the cuttings, we use what's called a bench counting scale. We start with weighing five or ten bundles. We weigh those, then we kind of tell it that that's how many bundles we have. You know, we have ten bundles here and then it determines a bundle weight. Then after that, we put all the other cuttings in loose and then it, it tells us how many bundles we cut. With the ISO machine, mo most of these plants, because they are loose, won't get the hor hormone application. That, that's why we bundle plants is so we can hormone them. So these will get the hormone applied fully early with a sprayer. So once the cuttings are taken out in the field or out in the greenhouse, we bring them in here. Um, I'm going to do most of the talking out here because the fans are really loud inside. So we like to keep the cuttings in here for at least a day before we stick them. They need time to slow their growth processes down and kind of cool down before we actually plant them. And then on the other end of that, we, we try to get them planted within four or five days 
um, any longer than that and they start to break down and get some rot. Now this is deciduous stuff. For evergreens you have a lot longer shelf life than the cooler. But, but for deciduous stuff about, about five days we'd like to get it planted. We run this at about 45 degrees. Um, yeah, just you know, much hotter than that, and they'd start start uh, breaking down faster, and much colder than that, and you'd have you know other issues where they'd freeze basically. We're going to talk about our uh, our soil mix and our, our mixing process here. The first of our three main ingredients is peat moss. As you can see, it comes in these giant bales, and then the machine behind me is a bale shaver. You open up the doors and there's a, there's a platform that you put the pallet on. Um, we'll take the plastic off to down about here, at the, just at the top of the pallet. And then it, it'll rise up and it's got, it's got blades on the top and it kind of shaves the peat off as, as needed and feeds into the hopper behind, behind the bale shaver there. Peat, peat is used for moisture retention, but if peat gets too dry, it gets what's called a hydrophobic. Once it gets hydrophobic, it's really hard to get it to wet back up again. Um, so one of the things we do to help with that is we use a wetting agent and we add that to the water and that kind of that kind of helps it stay stay more wet and not not dry out as bad so we're going to move on to uh, the next ingredient so over here we have perlite the perlite is used for um, for aeration it creates pore space you want pore space so that there's air in your mix and it, it's not completely wet and the, the roots can't breathe. So that's what perlite's used for. Um, there, are, there are a couple negatives with perlite and we're, we're looking for perlite alternatives. You don't always get the consistent mix with perlite. And I'll go grab a handful to show you what I'm talking about. So th this is perlite. And for those that don't know, it's, it's volcanic rock and it's heated up and popped like popcorn pretty much. Sometimes perlite's too fine or it's too coarse. So, so those are some of the negative side effects of perlite. Um, another one is it's very dusty and that can be an eye irritant. It's also, it's also bad to breathe. So next we'll move on to the uh, pine bark. All right, so, so this is pine bark. Um, again, this is used for moisture retention. It's also chunky, so it's got some pore space too. It's also very acidic. It's so acidic that we end up having to correct it with lime, but there are, there are crops like azaleas or blueberries. They really like the acidic soil, so when we're doing those, we just withhold the lime. So we kind of like that, you know, it kind of gives us a var variability in our mix. This is really heavy, uh, so we had, we had to get a hoist. Yeah, if you can see it, that, that hoist will lift these bags of pine bark and the perlite. That is one of the, the negative aspects of, of pine bark, is it, it is pretty, pretty heavy to handle. We thought we'd give you a close-up of the soil belt here. So as you can see, the, the peat moss comes in first and gets dropped on the belt. And then the perlite comes and gets dropped on. And then, then way back here, the pine bark gets dropped on. Our mix is about 40% peat moss, 30% perlite, and 30% pine bark. That's our standard mix. We do that for maybe 80, 85% of the stuff we produce here. The other stuff is either plugs where we withhold the pine bark or, um, or it's azalea mix where we withhold lime. So after the main ingredients, we add lime to raise the pH back up to like 5.8 to 6.2, you know, where plants really like it. And then we also add a slow release fertilizer. Our thoughts on adding slow release is, you know, when we're sticking plants, they don't have any roots for like the first month. So there's really no need for fertilizer to be present so so we use the slow release so it kind of is gradual and when the when the plants start rooting out there'll be fertilized soil near, nearby and then we also have an additional hopper that we use for for various things mostly it has like micro prills which is just like really tiny uh, prills of slow release fertilizer we use that in our plug mix yeah we've also tried uh, mycorrhizae we've we've done some trials with that we've used that hopper for that just any, anytime we want to experiment with something, we have, a, we have a hopper where we can apply it. This is all computer controlled. All of our flat filling equipment has sensors on it. When they get empty, a signal gets sent to the computer and it knows when, when to send soil. Each line can be running a different mix. That's really nice. Or, or if every line is running the same mix, we can just run the belts continuously so there's no, 
so the machine doesn't have to clear off the belt. It'll, it'll just be constant mix. So we, we, really, we really like that uh, feature. We got that, oh, probably five or six years ago. All right, so that wraps up our talk about soil. Next, we're going to move over to uh, our sticking lines and talk, talk about sticking. Due to the noise out in the potting room, we decided to shoot this out in the greenhouse where, where it was a little more quiet. So we're going to talk about the ISO machines now. ISO is the name of the company that we bought them from in the Netherlands. They're robotic stickers. So what happens is they take the cuttings, and there's two cameras on the machine. It takes a picture. One at a time, it'll grab however many cuttings are in the photo screen. It can stick about 2,000, 2000 to 2,200 cuttings per hour. Each machine can. We do have the capability to do hormone. There's a little cup that the cuttings could dip into. We don't like to use that all the time just because um, it, slows, it slows the machine down like 15 or 20 percent. So we, we only use that on plants that don't like foliar hormone. Every other plant, um, we, we, do, we apply foliar hormone out, out in the greenhouse. We stick about 40 to 50 percent of our, our product mix is able to be stuck with the robotic stickers. Things that work well are smaller plants with clean stems like Wygelas, Budleas, Dutia, Hydrangea paniculata, Hydrangea arborescence, and thing, things like that. Plants that don't stick very well um, are plants with thorns like Berberis or Roses. Plants that are really big like Hydrangea macrophylla or, or Sambucus, those plants kind of act like a broom so when it picked up one cutting it would sweep, it would sweep the cuttings around it and yeah, it's kind of counterproductive. Every variety has its own file in the computer, so we have to set that up and take anywhere from like eight to 12 pictures of each plant, and then you, you have to go and tell it where, where the stem is so it, know, it knows what, uh, what end of the cutting to pick up. We've just talked about getting an upgrade on our ISO machines, so we'll be able to do more product Right now, the machines struggle with plants that you, you can't tell up, up from down, like Cytisus. And we also think that it's going to improve, improve some of the varieties like uh, Spirea or Physocarpus where we, trim the, where we trim the tops. With the ISO machines, we also have the capability to double or triple stick. Uh, things that we do double stick are like uh, Cotone Aster and uh, Chinomalase. For 32s, we'll double stick. For, for the 18 cell, we'll triple stick it. So the remaining percentage that we can't stick with the ISO machine gets stuck manually. How we do that is we bundle those plants, that way they can receive a hormone dip before we stick them. Right now we're doing about 800 ppms of a product called Dip and Grow. Uh, we do that pretty much throughout the summer. In, in the winter time we'll get, we get into higher concentrations of hormone and we'll also use Hortus KIBA and for very tricky stuff we'll use a product called Hormex powder. Those concentrations will vary anywhere from from like a thousand up up until like eight. Yeah, I think eight thousand is the highest we've ever done. The sizes we can do manual stick. Uh, we do a 72 uh, plug tray. Then that that's for internal production. We we don't we don't sell that. We just use that to shift plants because it's a lot more space efficient. And then uh, we, we do our 32 tray, or two and a quarter is what we call it, or we do a four inch, uh, four inch tray, which is 18 cells. We, we don't do it very often, but we, we can directly stick into a QT if we, if we wanted to. So on the manual stick line, how that works is the first person in line, and that's usually one of your faster people, you, you try to put the slower person inside so they're kind of buffered by, by your, your rock stars. So the first person will do the first rough third of the tray. And then when they're done, they pass it on to the next person who does another third. And, and like I said, the, it's not exact. It's all based on when the, the person to your right is, is finished. You just kind of shift. Then the third person finishes off the tray and puts the, the label on the tray. I know it kind of seems like it wouldn't be faster to have three people touch the tray but you're eliminating any, any movement. You know, you don't have every, everybody's not reaching to put their own labels on the flat or, or somebody's reaching up to get the flat. O only one person's doing those jobs. We've seen quite an improvement. It was at least 20% improvement progressive over just an individual stick. 
at the end of our manual stick line, we have a watering tunnel, and, and I forgot to mention it, but we do have those on the ISO machine, and actually we have one before the plants get stuck on ISO, and then after. The one before kind of helps the plants kind of stay in that soil a little more. They don't tend to flop as much with the added water. And then the, the other ones just to kind of keep them somewhat wet until they get laid down out in the greenhouse. Today we're going to talk about booms and how, how to age out a crop. First we'll talk a little bit about the booms. Um, they're controlled by our environmental control system, which is called Argus. And when the plants are stuck, they don't have any roots, so they need mist pretty frequently. On a sunny day like today, a crop one is going to run probably every 10 to 15 minutes. And then as, as the plant matures and roots out, we, we back that mist off from there. We upgraded some of our oldest booms. Here and we also, we also added six additional ones. The main difference between our new booms and our, and our old booms is uh, the new ones are all encoder style. With our old booms, we had, we had magnets to, to differentiate the zones. The encoder measures it based on feet. So you, you have to put in like, okay, I've got a zone between uh, tw 20 feet and 50 feet in the house. And then you know, then you could have another zone at say 122 through 185. That's the main difference of an encoder versus magnet style. We tried two different encoder styles. So this here is a Zwart uh, Perfect Rain. They've got touch screens, so that that's kind of nice. The other new boom that we have is a is a GTI. It's their Common Sense 3 series, and they're they're a lot more similar to our older booms. Um, so there's a lot of familiarity there, just, just slightly different with the encoder style. So we decided to re replace this bay of seven booms here because they were, they were the oldest booms we had. Uh, and they were, they were a hose, uh, hose trolley system. So they, they didn't have a hose cart like, like these do. They had, they had a bunch of individual trolleys for the hose that it rested on. And those would get... The, all the the bearing uh, bearing slash wheels on them would all get seized up, and, and then you'd have to replace the whole trolley. Uh, so they were really they were really a burden to uh, to replace, um, and just you know kind of maintain. So we decided we decided it was time time for an upgrade, uh, and that's why we went to these encoder style booms. There's still a few kinks that we're working out, but I. I'm pretty confident once, once we work those out that we're going to be pretty happy with these booms. I'll talk a little bit more about our um, growing ranges here first. That We've got heated florists. In order to root, they like warm soil. So they'll root, they'll root faster if, if you heat the, heat the soil. So, so we heat our floors at about 65 degrees, I think, or between 60 and 70, to kind of depending on the time of year. Um, so we do that to kind of increase root, rooting, especially in the spring and the fall. We also have horizontal airflow air fans. We've got the shade cloth, which also in, in the summertime acts as our Japanese beetle screen. Um, we kind of double that up. And then uh, we also have backup irrigation sprinklers in case something were to happen to a boom and we needed to irrigate for, a, for you know, like a short period of time, like overnight or, or worst, like a, a weekend. We're, we're able to mimic the boom's frequency with, with the overhead irrigation. Now we'll switch over to the plants. Um, so, so after a crop one, we, we let a plant stay on crop one for, um, for two days. And then, then we, we just automatically switch it to a two. We don't, you know, we don't look for any signs of rooting or anything yet. It's just it's time, to, time to back it off a little bit. So from going from uh, crop two to crop three, you're looking for signs of rooting. So it presents itself in different ways for different plants. For this one, it presents the base of the stem kind of flared out and is starting, starting to kind of callous. Um, other, other plants present it by having little, little bumps or root initials form on the base of the stem. So that, then you would know it's time, okay, I bumped this two to crop three. Crop three to crop four is when you start to see root initials. Some of the bumps on this Wygela are, are actually forming actual initials and that's, that's when you know it's time to bump it to crop four. And then from crop four to crop five, that's when you actually see quite, quite a good amount of roots. Then five to six, more rooting. And then 
crop seven, if it's a faster crop, we'll skip crop seven. But if it's a slower crop, like a viburnum or something, something along those lines, we'll, we'll do a seven just to kind of give it a little more time to root, to completely root out or, or enough to, to move out to the growing area. And to avoid the shock of having miss and then, then suddenly not getting it, when it moves out to prop, they use their sprinklers and kind of mimic our booms. They just kind of back it off even further to kind of acclimate the plant. Not, not a constant mist like here, but more like a, a normal watering. Okay, so we're going to talk about our biological control program here. We started that three years ago now. It's helped reduce our pesticide costs greatly. It's beneficial for us because there's no REI on a beneficial release. So the workers can go back in immediately. You don't have to wait. Our main pest in propagation is fungus gnats. We have multiple different uh, biologicals that focus on that pest. Uh, the first one is nematodes. We apply them with a high pressure sprayer. We've got a nozzle with a pretty wide opening so they'll fit, they'll fit through there. We turn the pressure down pretty low. In addition to the, the nematodes for controlling fungus gnats, we also use hypoaspis and athena beetles. They also go after the fungus gnat larvae. The fungus gnat larvae eat, eat the roots uh, as they're emerging off the plant, that's why it's, they're pretty de detrimental to, to the plants. We also use cucumeris. They come in sachets. We stick those in any plant that's susceptible for broad mites. It also helps a little bit on thrips. We also do persimilis to control uh, spider mites. So we put that on any spider mite prone plants, such as like roses is a big one, or buddleia. Another way that we control fungus gnats is um, we put this yellow tape in between all the houses that don't have a sidewalk. It does a pretty good job. It catches quite a few fungus gnats and we'll, we'll leave it up for a week or two and then we replace it. We also, we also do monitoring with small yellow sticky cards and we do that every week to monitor what, what kind of pests we're catching and stuff. We've had quite a bit of success with this program and we, we look to keep improving and uh, expanding on it in the future. We're going to talk about uh, transplanting. We don't propagate everything here in propable shift sizes. So a lot of our shifts are from a direct stuck 72 cell tray to a, um, to a QT or sometimes we'll do to a four inch. We'll also shift like a two and a quarter to a four inch or a two and a quarter to a QT. Very rarely do we do a four inch to a QT, but it, it does happen. We've got two lines that handle transplanting. One is what we call the wagon. It's very low tech and it's kind of inefficient. We're looking into upgrading that line. The other line, we have a TTA transplanter machine on it that'll take 72 plugs and transplant them into a QT tray. And like the ISO machines, it, it, it can't do every variety. It probably does, I think it's somewhere between 30 and 40%. And for that machine, it's real dependent on how, how early you get the, uh, the plug. If it's too rooted in and, and the roots stick to the side of the tray, it's really hard for the fingers to pull the plant out. On the other end, you don't want it too early or else the fingers don't pull. So the timing is a big issue with, with the transplanter. We're looking into grow coons to see if, if that would allow us to get a greater plant selection. Hopefully in the future we'll be able to do more, more and more mixes with the uh, transplanter. Now we don't do this often, but if we were to run the transplanter part of the line all day, we could do about 6,000 flats a day. We typically don't have enough material to do that throughout for an entire day. So some, some days we'll probably do like 4,000 flats with the transplanter and then we'll have to do some by hand either on the wagon or we can run that transplanting line without the actual transplanter itself. We just kind of run that belt manually. On the end of the transplanting line, at the end of last year, we installed a cart loader. It waits for six trays, and then once it gets six trays, it pushes it onto the cart. And that eliminates a person from having to put every single flat on a cart. And now, now we only have to have a person do that uh, to change out the carts. And, and we're, looking, we're looking into getting an, an index so it'll string five carts together. And so that person would be even, you know, even further removed and could spend more time planting instead of uh, moving carts. Also another benefit of this machine is we were able to add a seventh shell. When they're loading it by hand it'd be really fatiguing to reach up and, and put the trays on that, that seventh shell. 
they don't mind pulling it off, but putting it up there is pretty strenuous. So with that machine able to do that, we're able to get an extra, an extra six flats on every cart load. So that's been pretty helpful too. Some other additions um, that we're looking to make in the future is we're, we're looking to get automatic labelers for, the, for each, each line, the sticking, sticking and transplanting. We're also going to start looking into uh, pot and tray stackers. Our trays have two parts. They have an insert that's got the, the individual cells and then they have the bottom carrier tray. And what we were hoping is the machine could, could load, load those two together. That, that way we can eliminate a person doing that. I thought since I had the opportunity that I'd, I'd let you guys know that one of our fellow IPPS members and uh, head propagator here at Spring Meadow Nursery, Gail Berner, has announced that after 26 years here, she's going to retire at the end of the season. I was just hoping that maybe you guys could reach out and share some unique story you guys share or, or, or you know, just say congratulations. I think she'd really appreciate that. So I hope you guys enjoyed this uh, propagation tour here at Spring Meadow Nursery, and I'll catch you, uh, catch you for the question session afterwards. All right, that was awesome, Jeff. Did you put <laughs> did you put that together? Um, I I had a video a videographer here help help me out, so. I was going to say you have another, you have a dual career, uh, if that was all you. <laughs> um, oh, no. That, that was a really great video. Props to that person who, who did that uh, and you for all your awesome dialogue and, the, and just awesome visuals. Um, I, yeah, for, for somebody like me who does this on a very small scale, it's cool to see just like the crazy scale that you're doing it on. Um, so let's... Let's jump into some questions. Looks like there's a lot of a lot of people in the chat um, saying how great this was, and I totally agree with them. Um, congrats to Gail uh, and Stephanie put in the chat uh, a way to get in touch with Gail. Um, let's see what. Um, so I, I had a question. What uh, what slow release fertilizer are you using in your in your uh, prop mix oh we used to use osmocote but I, I think we're using something different I, i'd have to i'd have to check for you just a just a nerdy uh um growing media question um and then just like what uh general size of the operation um you know i, I i'm lucky if i do a few hundred cuttings in a day you're probably doing that every second so <laughs> just like a, ge a general idea obviously we, a lot of people at IPPS probably know your awesome work at Spring Meadow, but I just don't have an idea for how big you are. Yeah, we, we keep growing every year. So it's hard, it's hard to have an exact acreage, but we're probably, we're probably getting close to 50 acres of production greenhouse. Wow. And then, uh, shoot, we probably have like six acres of, of research and development greenhouse and then probably 40 acres of stock field and quite, quite a few Quonsets uh, for, for stock plants that they can't handle out in the field. That's, that's a little bigger than us. Uh, <laughs> um, so Mark DeBard asks, what's your recipe for Syringa? Um, any tips for growing lilacs? Yeah, so we so we do lilacs. Um, we put those in our um, our fog houses. They have higher humidity. Um, that, that's kind of the trick. The trick with them is they they like more more humidity. Uh, it kind kind of depends on the type of lilac too. Like our bloomerang types, they root fairly quick. The the hyacinthiflora type, um, they they're a little longer. They take longer to, to root out. We do for those. We do like a tip cutting, so it'll have like four to six leaves on it. And this yeah, is, that's, that's obviously softwood or semi, you know, yeah. green wood or something. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and in terms of biologicals, do you, do you see a lot of, do you see beneficial sort of coming up to a certain level after you've applied them for a while, like with the nematodes or do you see just populations that are sort of stabilizing or anything like that? Yeah, I, I'm not uh, completely directly involved with the biologicals. 
but um yeah, I know they do. They do see the biologicals out. They'll be walking around, and we'll see athea beetles flying through the air and, and stuff like that. And we catch, we catch biologicals on our sticky cards all the time. Nice. Um, John Yori asks, do you have? Do you do any liquid feeds? Uh, if so, what's your, what's your NPK usually? Um, we we don't do liquid feed in the propagation side just because um, it would create so much um, algae growth on all the sidewalks. Um, but the growing department does do liquid feed. Um, in the spring and fall, it's, it's 14, 4, 14. And then in the summer, I believe they're using a 35, 5, 10. Nice. Um, all right, last call for, oh, we got one more here. Mark Volpe asks, could you talk about light control and light levels for rooting cuttings um yeah so so in the summertime we're we're not doing we we have our 50 percent shade um that acts as our japanese beetle can screen um and if we won't we won't use that until until it's warm enough to to vent you know we we'll try to get as much natural sunlight as we can um, in the winter time, that's when we, we, we also have a couple um, bays of lights. We got one bay of LEDs and one bay or two bays of high pressure sodium. Um, and I know I know there's like a threshold where, where the lights come on, but I, I don't know what it is off the top of my head. But most of what you do is is natural light, right? Is it, yeah. Right. right. Um, okay, one two more questions. We're just gonna keep going. Um, <laughs> And of course, Brian Maynard's popped in here too. Uh, Kyle Mitchell asks, advantages of powder, root, powder rooting hormone over liquid, uh, and then why you switch to Hormex after using dip and grow? Or maybe just generally, why would you switch to a powder over a liquid? Um, yeah, we, we only use it in very, very seldomly do we use it. It's just a couple of really tricky evergreens. And we probably we probably saw that somebody else had success with the Hormex, so that's that's why we tried it. Gotcha. Um, that's like asking someone what's what's their favorite child. Uh, there's there's everyone has an opinion, right? Uh, we do a lot of liquid uh, hormone, but of course, people uh, it depends on what application you're doing. Uh, Pat Joyce asks, when you're backing off the mist, can you talk about the different stages? Do you decrease the mist time by certain in increments? Yeah, so that, that's all based on VPD. So we set we set a threshold. Like for crop one, I think the threshold's like 2.4. And then every time it, it accumulates that, it'll mist. Uh, we, we've got that environmental control system that, that does all this. And then like I think crop two is like 3.4. And then, you know, as the crop gets older, that threshold gets higher. So the boom runs less and less frequently. Um, okay, Brian, thanks for pulling this into chat or from chat. Sherry Milano asks, do you ever do rooting in just water or aeroponics? That's a good question. Um, no, no, we just kind of do the, the conventional stuff. We we did we did try a growth chamber for a year, um, and I think I think we'll we'll do that later. We kind of tabled it uh, because of COVID. Gotcha. And then Brian asks, what percentage of cuttings are treated with foliar hormone? Um, I'd say I'd say probably thirty five. It it's probably it's probably like eighty five or ninety percent of the stuff we stick on the ISO machine. Um, the only things we we will manual dip with the ISO machine are Dervilla, Physocarpus, and Ligostromia. They, they don't seem to like the foliar um, hormone. Um, Robin asks, do you propagate junipers? Any tips? Um, we do propagate junipers. Um, the upright ones are, are kind of tricky. Um, I, I think we use about 4,000 PPM on them. And we've, we've tried lights, but I don't think we saw a big difference. They, they kind of rooted poorly with or without the lights. So we're, yeah, we're kind of struggling with those two. All right. 
Well, thanks, Jeff. Uh, I think that's we've answered. You've answered quite a bit of questions, and you answered a, a bunch uh, while the video was going. So um, double work there. Um, I'll just one more reminder to everybody: uh, the Eastern IPPS Eastern Region 2021 uh, Annual Conference at the Morton Arboretum, uh, September 28th through October 1st. Get hyped! Um, again, ena.ipps.org, uh, and there should be a program for everybody shortly. Um, thanks again, Jeff. That video was awesome. Uh, your operation is awesome. It's really cool to, to be able to see that, especially when you know we're not at a meeting uh, and we're not up there with you. So thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye, guys.